Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a drink, it is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Granny Gear Games today put patch 3.22.1 live. I'll put a link to its patch notes down in the description below. They do say that they're a patch preview, but that was posted before the patch went live. You might notice this video looks a little bit different to usual. That's because I am recording it and editing it on my old PC. My new PC has problems with its power supply unit, and that means that I'll probably not be on Twitch this week. Now, this patch had a number of big problems with it, and we'll get to that in a sec. But firstly, let's talk about what the patch actually included in the way of new features. Being a 0.1 patch, i.e. one of the ones that's defined by only three numbers, these tend to be the bigger of the patches in the middle of a league cycle. And this is no real exception, it includes six new items, albeit just tattoos that were spoiled last week, and it also includes a couple of things players have been asking for, but not necessarily in the way they were asking for them. So, there is a forfeit button that you can use in Trials of the Ancestors. However, this is very, very limited. It is only available once your character has been permanently banned from the fight, i.e. your totem has been destroyed. In this situation, you can forfeit the match. You might forfeit it from a losing position because it's just a matter of time until you end up being completely destroyed. But you might also forfeit sometimes from a winning position because you've worked out that it's probably going to be 6, 8, 10 minutes until your minions end up winning the fight and you've decided that you'd rather eat the loss than wait that much time in order to potentially win without any real guarantee you're going to win. Whatever your strategic use of this is, the forfeit button is there, but it's only there once you've been banned from the fight. And this is not what people were wanting to see. I think what a lot of people were hoping for was a forfeit button that you could use once it became clear that you had no real path to victory in that particular match. And especially when your character is under a long stun or has just been slain and you're waiting to revive, that's the sort of situation in which you might want to go, yeah, you know what, this isn't worth it. I'm just going to forfeit out of this one because I don't think I can turn things around. A forfeit button that was more universal like that would be better. It would definitely need a confirmation button, otherwise it would be worse than the status quo, but I don't think that this was the improvement that people were hoping for here. There is a revive progress indicator, so if your character is dropped to zero life in the Trials of the Ancestors, you get temporarily banned from that fight for an escalating period of time. It's only a few seconds, but it does feel like an eternity because Path of Exile is such a fast-moving game. And this revive indicator is the one thing that this patch got absolutely and positively right. If you die, now you have the ability to make an informed decision. Do you have enough time to look up a cat meme on the internet, or are you going to be back in a second and a half? You'll be able to make that decision and make it correctly, and that's because of this patch. Definitely something that needed to happen. Really should have been there on day one, but the second best time is today. This revive indicator is a huge improvement. Now, there's also a mention here that a number of bugs were fixed. Unfortunately, one of those bugs, the fix was worse than the original problem. And there's been a change that's been made that has decreased the loading screen time for town areas. This one, however, has definitely been an improvement. Anyways, let's go through the Trials of the Ancestors improvements and fixes. So the first three are things we've already discussed. Two new field items have been added. Generally speaking, the field items have been a real disappointment so far, at least in my experience. There is now a vendor recipe that lets you trade three tattoos from a tribe in order to get a single random tattoo of that same tribe. Now, if you're in Solo Self Found, this is probably going to be a quasi-useful thing. You might only want two tattoos that are tied to a specific tribe, and if you can turn in three, and get maybe a 1 in 4 chance of getting one of the two that you want back. That's a small upgrade, it's not much of an upgrade, but it is something. And so in SSF, it's a small thing. But if you're playing in Trade League, this is going to have a big impact on the availability of the low-end tattoos. If you want a tattoo that is very off-meta, you're going to be finding that a lot of other players are not going to be listing it anymore. Instead, they're going to be destroying it, chasing one of the more desirable tattoos. This is probably going to end up being quite annoying if you're in Trade League and you want something obscure. That said, it's going to then result in some of the tattoos that are currently valueless having a little bit of value, so that's just the way that things crumble out there. There's a quality of life change that when you're buying favours from various NPCs, you will be able to see which of your warriors were used and which ones were not. But then we have the big changes to balance that come up here. Seems to be about buffing the weaker units and nerfing the stronger ones. Buffing weak units and nerfing strong ones ends up hurting the player overall. And I feel that terminology needs a clarification. When I say hurts the player, I mean it reduces the amount by which the player can gain an advantage through skill over the enemies that they're fighting in the arena. This is because the enemies don't have tactical unit selection, whereas the player does. The player can raise a focus in on the best units. The enemies end up using whatever they've got access to, 
and having them be more homogenized removes some of the advantage that the player can get through a basic strategy of just going for the highest quality units, the best value ones, all of the time. It is still worth saying though that there are many people beating the Trials of the Ancestors at rank 2000 using strategies that are mostly not about their character's own combat prowess. So do keep in mind that all of the power level changes to the various champions and NPCs that you can select here, these are going to end up making Trials of the Ancestors broadly speaking harder if you are already very good at the mechanic, whereas they're not going to have much of an impact if you're someone that doesn't really know all the ins and outs of the mechanic as yet. Some warriors were unusually tanky, they're being nerfed. Some warriors were too expensive for the power that they provided, they've had their costs reduced. The Spear Dancer has been double nerfed, damage has been reduced and also the range has been reduced. Very important thing to keep in mind here is that beyond a certain point of progression in trial rank, this is not going to matter for you because you're still going to die to one hit from it. And ultimately the amount of damage that it does doesn't matter all that much. There is no difference between a monster doing a million raw physical damage to you and 700,000 raw physical damage to you because both are in almost all situations going to instantly kill your character. However, there is definitely a sweet spot where this is going to be the difference between you being one shot by this spear ability and being hit really hard by it, but still being able to fight on. Also, the range nerf is gonna make this unit considerably weaker, and that is not going to be affected by the tier that you're running these content at. A couple of things that didn't previously interrupt now do. And the Titanic Shell Warrior has now been nerfed in multiple different ways. A number of the weaker champions are now fiercer than they used to be. Atula's Fireball now does more damage at monster level 83, which is most of the time you'll spend in the Trial of the Ancestors if you do this content a lot. Rakiata's Geyser and Sweep are now doing more damage than they used to do, as well as Leap Slam. And Calm Slam and Fire Fist skills have now been buffed as well. But the really significant change in terms of NPCs is the behavior changes to the chieftains. This is the other team's boss. They are now much smarter than they used to be, and this intelligence is something that makes them genuinely fearsome. This makes trials considerably harder using the strategies that players were using to somewhat cheese them before. A lot of those strategies no longer work or are nowhere near as reliable as they used to be. A number of the field items have been buffed considerably, and time will tell whether they end up being worth it or not. So far, they weren't really worth it in patch 3.22.0, but maybe these will end up being enough that we'll be able to experiment with them more and find some use for them. And the various loyalty tattoos have been buffed considerably. These loyalty tattoos are definitely worth exploring, and there's something I should probably make another video on at some point, because they give a powerful buff to your character. In a lot of ways, they're somewhat akin to the Harbinger unique items, which will have a significant boost to your character's core performance, in addition to whatever the item's normal stats are. Now there's a number of other little bug fixes here that are not particularly massive, but that would occasionally come up and they're worth having a bit of a read through, but nothing that I feel is necessary to really call out. Now we have the biggest change of all. Loading screens no longer wait to finish loading the visual effects of other characters before you load into the area. So if you're going into the Rogue Harbor and inside the Rogue Harbor, the specific instance of it that you're put into, there are 24 players total and 20 of them are wearing all sorts of different rainbow outfits all sorts of visual clown suits. Those clown suits are no longer going to need to load before you are off the load screen to the Rogue Harbor. Instead, you'll zone in, those characters will look a bit bad for a sec, then they will start to load. And then as they do load, they'll either look good or bad depending upon the specific MTX the player has chosen to use. This is going to be a huge improvement and it already has been. A lot of those sorts of areas like the Rogue Harbor are now much faster than they used to be. Then there's a number of other changes that are quite unrelated to that. So this is probably the single most important change in the entire patch. Then they go straight on to a slight change to a rare monster mod, and then to a change that was briefly discussed at Exocon, where instead of weapon ranges and various other ranges within the game being discussed as being 40 units, that will now be four meters. The problem is a lot of things don't say, hey, I'm the Occultus Profane Bloom Ascendancy Notable, and I have an explosion radius of 2.3 meters. Instead, they just say that there's an explosion. And then you have to try and find some unofficial source to say, oh, it's actually 23 units, which is now being described as 2.3 meters. One thing that is standardized is that anytime an ascendancy notable, and specifically we're talking about ascendancy notables here, whenever they talk about nearby, they mean six meters, which is actually a big chunk of the screen, but all sorts of other things are completely different. And I would really like to see all of the vague wording that exists in the game get replaced by the exact distances. A clarification has been made to the destructive play Atlas Keystone for the Maven. Now this is the one that causes the Maven to spawn a few seconds into a boss fight 
and generate a few additional random map bosses. These random map bosses don't expedite your path to the next Maven Tenway, but what they do do is they can drop Shaper Guardian maps, Elder Guardian maps, Conqueror maps, all these sorts of good things, Synthesis maps, and that's the reason that there's a few more of those available in Trade League this league than there have been in recent times. It's because of destructive play, it's a reasonably good keystone, but it's something that doesn't do anything unless the boss survives a few seconds, long enough for the Maven to pop in and say, hello, here's some extra monsters for you to kill. The challenge related to rituals has been nerfed really hard. It now requires you only to kill rare or unique monsters instead of just unique, and the numbers on that were really high as well. So that's going to be something that will have people who don't like ritual very much breathing a big sigh of relief. And there's a few other little things in the general improvement section. Next, there's some things that relate only to controllers and some things that relate only to Ruthless, both of which will affect a small section of the player base. Feel free to have a look at those if you're interested. And then we have the section on bug fixes. Now there's a few things here that are pretty notable, like fixed a bug that caused Stygian Spires in Abyssal Lich fights to not spawn any monsters. That's a reasonably big deal, that's going to make those Abyssal Lich fights a little bit more impactful, a little bit more interesting, and it's also going to mean that you'll get more flask charges back during them. But amongst all of the small changes that affect a small percentage of the player base, like the changes to Primal Clush Core that only apply if you're both doing Einhar's Memory of Harvest Beast, and you also use the seventh gate Atlas Keystone passive. And now we have the line of text that seemed so innocent and caused so many problems. Fixed a rare bug that allowed dead characters to remain in hardcore leagues. This bug affected less than 100 characters. This sounds like a very small, very simple, straightforward fix. However, it was anything but. There was a bug that was allowing characters to accumulate deaths on their deaths counter in Hardcore as a result of the Trials of the Ancestors content. If you died after being declared the winner of a Trial of the Ancestors, and potentially after being declared the loser as well, I'm not so sure there, then in that situation you could gain a Slash Deaths counter. This meant that your character would say that they had actually died, but that you'd remained inside the Hardcore League because the intended behaviour is that if you die in Hinakora's realm, you don't actually die. That's a part of the core gameplay loop, is that you do die a bunch in the Trials of the Ancestors. That's the intended behavior. What happened is that all the characters who had died after being declared the winner of a match, as a result of some sort of DOT, or as a result of any other effect, those characters got initially resurrected in Hardcore, but then later retroactively permanently moved to Standard by patch 3.22.1. It does look like GGG are fixing this situation now. They've currently got all of those characters in a quarantine void league, and they've also made it impossible to delete them. I think they're going to have some sort of meeting tomorrow when Chris Wilson gets back, and then decide what happens. Fundamentally, Hardcore works under the principle that the server is authoritative on whether your character died or not, even if a bug is involved. If your character dies in Hardcore as a direct result of a bug, and that is 100% proven, it doesn't matter. The server said your character died, therefore your character stays dead. In fact, in order to start a Hardcore character at all, you have to explicitly agree to that. GGD tell you that and force you to click a confirmation button before you're allowed to make any individual Hardcore character. So that is the rules that they use when determining whether a character dies or not as a result of a bug. Really, that should apply in reverse as well. If a player genuinely does die, but a game bug says, no, you didn't die, then ultimately the same rules should apply. The server, aka the umpire, should be authoritative. It's not always going to be fair, but it's fairer than any other alternative, and it is certainly a lot fairer than any situation where there are case-by-case -case exceptions made. So this was an absolute schmozzle. There'll probably be some fallout tomorrow. I'm expecting that we'll get an authoritative answer and probably even a write-up of exactly what happened from Chris Wilson because he's tended to do this in the past when there's been something that has seriously messed up the Hardcore League. Performance issues have been fixed in the Infested Valley map. This is a buff. This was something that was a complete nightmare. The Infested Valley map was really, really running badly. I had noticed it in Calm's Dream and Calm's Stronghold because you don't spend very long there, but the Infested Valley was a complete schmozzle, and that being fixed is now a huge improvement. And then there's a million and one other little bug fixes that are worth having a read through. Most of them won't apply to you. Most of them are very specific, like for instance, the combination of Flamewood support inside the Black Zenith Unique Gloves, or the combination of the Tomb Fist Unique Gloves and Uchula's Hunger Unique Body Armor. These were also broken as well. Lots of little things like that, but 
a lot of these things are still worth having a quick read through to see if any of them apply. Probably most significant to most players is the Cortex Map Boss Hard Mode that is one of the challenges in patch 3.22. That has now been fixed, that was no longer working. And also the Eternal Labyrinth of Fortune, i.e. the Tribute Labyrinth, that was not giving credit towards the end game grinds encounter. So that means that the 20 chests that I did in Tribute Labs actually didn't count, which I only realized once I read these patch notes. Okay, so that's what's in patch 3.22.1, but there is one very important thing that is not in here, and that needs to be mentioned quickly, and that is a way to reset your rating somehow in the Trials of the Ancestors content. If you're playing a character in Delve, and you're doing really well in Delve, you're pushed down to 800 depth, and then you decide, you know what, I want to respect my character. I no longer want to be in a setup that is optimized for Delve. Instead, what I want to do is have something that is optimized for faster mapping. I'm going to become much less tanky, and I'm going to become much faster. Well, you can then go back into Delve later, and you're not forced to start back at depth 800. Instead, you can say, my character's a lot worse at Delve than it used to be, I'm just going to start at 350. That should be comfortable, that should be fun, and you'll be able to get rewards there. They will be the rewards for depth 350 Delving, they won't be the superior rewards you'd be getting if you continued Delving at 800, but you'll be able to play the content, and you'll be able to profit from the content. Likewise, if you design a character that is a really powerful boss killer, you have Uber Shaper on farm, and then at some point you decide, you know what, I'm sick of this trap thing, I'm going to do something else with my character. You make a more well-rounded character that's good at the rest of the game, but is much worse at bossing, and then you can go back and do normal Shaper instead. You can still experience the same content, you can still get most of the rewards, not all of them, but most of them. Well, with Trials of the Ancestors, if you can get your rank up to 800, or 1000, or 1500, or 1800, or the maximum 2000, and then you respec your character to something that's not very good for Trials of the Ancestors, or maybe your original strategy that allowed you to get that far in the Trials of the Ancestors ends up getting broken, then in that situation, you are in a real problem where you just can't access the lower tiers of Trials of the Ancestors at all. Now, this patch has nothing to fix that. This patch really needed to fix that. And ultimately, it seems clear that GGG want this to go core. A lot of the player base want this to go core as well, but I feel like it's not ready to go core until it has that. It would be perfectly reasonable to require players to spend some sort of resources in order to reset their rating, because ultimately, I don't think you want it to be the most profitable way to play the content is just play up until 900, then reset down to 200, then keep doing this over and over again. You want it to be that pushing as far as you can is the best way to play it, but that if you want to chill out and do a low stress version of one of these trials, you should have the ability to do that. The moment you don't, and I think that's the thing that was really sorely needed to be added in this patch, it's not there, but I'm going to leave it there. Mayavalops have interesting results, and don't use one on your computer's power supply.